started right on schedule. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Um, so to the very first Open Sustainability Policy Summit, I'm Alex Thornton, Executive Director of LF Energy. Uh, I'm joined with Jonathan Moore of the John Hopkins Inclusive Innovation Initiative, and uh, we'll be your MCs for the next two days. Uh, just before we get started, um, a reminder of our event code of conduct. All attendees need to feel welcome and included, um, and we take this seriously, so if anybody has any issues, please speak to staff. Um, and also, I want to thank Johns Hopkins for hosting us in this beautiful, amazing venue, uh, and all of our community partners for, for helping put this together. Um, okay. So yeah, this, as I said, the very first Open Sustainability Policy Summit. Um, thanks for taking a bet with us here. It's the first one. Uh, hopefully people get out of bed and join us soon. Um, this is a group of people who don't like taking the beaten path, right? Uh, we don't like upholding the status quo. We like to find new and interesting ways of solving problems in a better way. <clears throat> Even though a lot of people will tell us we're crazy and it won't work. That applies both to the energy transition as well as to open source. And this conference, the next two days, is about the intersection of those two things. <clears throat> so let's start with the energy transition. So as most of you know, we're undergoing a huge change in how we produce, distribute, and consume energy, right? Historically, we had huge centralized power plants sending power monodirectionally to be consumed at the edge. It was simple, one way, centralized planning, top down. And we're completely turning it on its head. And we're doing it because we have decarbonization goals. It's hot, have you noticed it's hot today? Um, and we need to do something about it, so we need to decarbonize our energy system. And we do that by renewable power generation, carbon-free energy, typically variable distributed, and we electrify everything. We're increasing our grid edge load, uh, and oftentimes that edge load is becoming more and more flexible. But that results in you have multi-directional power flows. We're dealing with grid congestion. There's all these changes in complexity that are unprecedented. This is the biggest change in our electricity system since the invention of the grid. So how do we solve this? Now, historically, what we would do is we would try to build things. More wires, more transformers, more distribution feeders. Assume the worst. So build in tons of tolerances to ensure that even in the worst case scenario, everything will work just fine. And there are a lot of issues with that. The first one costs a lot of money. If you're overbuilding capacity, you're wasting money on stuff that oftentimes you don't need. Materials cost a lot of money. Labor is very expensive. The other issue is it takes a lot of time. It takes time to get permits, time to get right of way, time to address legal challenges. And with decarbonization, we don't have a ton of time. We need to move quickly. So what do we do? Unfortunately, uh, policymakers, regulators are starting to lead the way, right? So FERC, chairman says, we need to squeeze everything out of our existing grid. And they're issuing orders to that effect. We've got DOE providing policy reports on, you know, non-traditional methods of expanding grid capacity, virtual power plants. There are solutions that exist, and those solutions tend to be data-driven, digital optimization of our physical infrastructure. Right? We need to squeeze everything we can out of the physical assets, build only what we need, and apply that digital layer on top of the physical. So enter open source. So for, for folks who aren't as involved in open source, just think of it as a way of collaboration and sharing investment in R&D. <clears throat> and it's done in the open. Anybody can view it. Anybody can change it. Anybody can redistribute it according to a certain license. And so you can think about this as historically you'd have you know, 
three entities that would build a foundation, build their own product on top of it. And instead of doing that, they share the investment. They work together, they build that foundation together, and then they can compete on top of that foundation. And that's extremely powerful. It's changed the way that modern technology is built. <clears throat> there are a multitude of benefits, some of them. You accelerate innovation because you work together. You can move more quickly in building that foundation, and it reduces the individual cost on any one organization. You get improved security because you have more transparency. You can literally examine every single line of code if you wanted to. Now, there are security challenges as well, but those are manageable, and we'll be talking about that later in the, the conference. You get improved interoperability because just due to the collaborative distributed nature, you need that interoperability. And you get great long-term maintainability because you're building a common core, a shared foundation that everybody is building on. <clears throat> now, some may think, well, open source, that's great, but that's just for you know, ponytailed hippies and you know, who like to give things away. But in fact, the, the biggest contributors to open source are also the most valuable competitive companies in the world. Right? We have Google and Microsoft in the room today. They're also the most uh, prolific contributors to open source. <clears throat> so it's good for business. Open source transforms industries, even highly regulated conservative ones. Finance, nobody would call finance a, a traditionally innovative industry. Extremely regulated, very conservative. We have uh, names you wouldn't normally associate with innovation. JP Morgan, Royal Bank of Canada, Goldman Sachs, they've all embraced open source to serve their own competitive interests. Telecom and networking, similarly, highly regulated, hardware intense. They also have gone through a huge evolution of open source. And telecom by now, as of 2020, 70% of global sub subscribers are using a network that's powered by open source. And the reason why is because it accelerates dramatically the rate of innovation. They went from new releases every three to six years to six to nine months. It's incredible. And so if you take the power of that and you apply it to energy, and accelerating the energy transition, that's what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to work together to move faster because that's what we need to do to decarbonize. So LF Energy exists to accelerate the energy transition, build the communities, this one, to develop open technologies and standards. And we do that by doing all of the supporting work besides the code, besides the technology, to ensure that it thrives that it's sustainable. So we're a neutral host for these projects. We help determine project governance so that for long-term decision-making, uh, we provide resources, events like this one, to build a community. The list goes on. There's a lot of activities that are required to make sure a project is successful besides just the code, and our job is just to help. We're supporting. Uh, LF Energy is uh, member-funded, so Thank you to everybody for supporting our work, uh, especially those who came out today. And we've got a, a broad portfolio of projects. This doesn't even include all of them, um, some of whom you're going to hear talk uh, over the next two days. I really believe that open source is building the future of energy. We are going to solve this problem. We're going to solve it together. And so thank you for being here. It's going to be a great couple of days. I look forward to, to collaborating with you all.